Hey folks, Andy Patton here. The Zags got back in the 100 plus points category with a win over the Pilots on Saturday. BYU lost to Pacific in a huge game for the WCC's at-large goals. We're going to discuss all of that here on Mailbag Monday here on Locked on Zags. Don't go away. Don Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. I want to thank all of you who make this podcast your first listen of the day. It is sincerely appreciated to be a part of your daily routine. I also appreciate all of you who have checked out the show on YouTube. You can find it on youtube.com. Search Locked on Zags. Post it on social media as well. We are crushing our goals for the Locked on Zags YouTube channel. I really appreciate all of you who have checked it out. If you have not yet... I would sincerely appreciate you giving it a subscription. Just go to the Locked on Zags, hit that subscribe button. We're very, very close to 300 subscribers shooting to get to 500 by the time the Zags tear those nets down in April. Also, today is Mailbag Monday. If you have not participated in Mailbag Monday and are interested in doing so, it is very simple. You can reach out to me on Twitter at ScoreZagScore or at LockedOnZags whenever you are thinking of a question. It helps if you tag it Mailbag Monday. Otherwise, I might just respond to the question and not actually put it into my show notes. But if you do that, I'll get it in the notes. I also post a tweet on Sunday morning soliciting questions from my main account. You can respond to that tweet and I will get your question into the show. And some of you have maybe wondered this. If I like your tweet, that means that I have gotten your question and I have put it into my notes. That is a good way for you to ensure that your question will be answered that week's episode. You can also email me at andypatton one at gmail.com. That is a great way to ask multiple questions at once, uh, to have more of a dialogue about said questions, uh, or to just interact with me in a different medium for those of you who maybe do not use Twitter. Tons of great questions for this week. We're going to start out with John via Gmail. He asked, how do you feel about Gonzaga's chances of winning the national championship? Now, John provided a lot of reasons why he believes that Gonzaga is in a good spot, and all of them were fantastic reasons. Uh, but really, right now, it's kind of simple. They're shooting the absolute crap out of the basketball. They made 18 threes against the Portland Pilots. It is really hard to not feel excellent about Gonzaga's chances of winning it all right now with the way that they are shooting. Yes, of course, it's Portland. Yes, of course, it was LMU earlier. And yes, of course, these many of these teams that Gonzaga is playing right now are not going to be in the NCAA tournament, a topic we're going to discuss at length in the second segment of this show. But Gonzaga has proven this was kind of the last step. You know, they're a fantastic interior scoring team. Drew Timmy is one of the best in the nation at scoring with his back to the basket under the hoop. He is elite at it. Even if his last couple of games have not been up to Drew Timmy's standards in terms of scoring, he is still one of the best low post scores in the country. Chet Holmgren has emerged as a force down low as a score. And then you add Anton Watson, who we're talking about a little bit more in this show, who has been incredible, not just on offense, but on both sides of the ball this year. Gonzaga defensively has been great. They play great on-ball defense. They've improved at defending the perimeter. Their half-court and full-court traps have been really, really successful. you got guys like Hunter Salas and Anton Watson coming off the bench, providing this elite level of defense. Chet Holmgren's one of the best rim protectors, if not the best rim protector in the entire country, a candidate for the Naismith Defensive Player of the Year award. On top of all of that, the two biggest weaknesses this team had were costly turnovers and an inability to consistently shoot from the outside. They have seemed to push both of those concerns aside. They have gotten way, way better at taking care of the basketball. Now they're not facing as many physical opponents as they did in the non-conference slate when they faced Duke, when they faced Alabama, even when they faced Tarleton State, who's a team that had a lot of physicality on that perimeter. So there's a little bit of concern that maybe some of those issues crop up again when they get into the NCAA tournament, when they start facing some of those more aggressive physical teams. 
but the three point shooting was not something that they could use to bail them out before. And now it is a cr- tremendous weapon for this team. They are knocking down threes at an unbelievably elite clip. If they continue to shoot this well, or even close to this well, they don't have to shoot, you know, they don't have to make 18 threes every game to win the national championship. I'm going to tell you right now, if they keep knocking down 18 threes a game, they're probably going to win the national championship, but they don't need that to win it all. What they need is to be consistent enough from out there that teams have to honor it. They have to respect it. That allows Drew Timmy or Chet Holmgren or Anton Watson more room in the paint. It allows them to get good looks. It allows the guards more room to potentially make backdoor cuts, something that many of Gonzaga's players, notably Hunter Salas, are extremely good at. Our guards are getting have elite court vision, so they can make those passes. They can knock down those shots. It gives Gonzaga just more weaponry. If they can continue to shoot this well, continue to take care of the basketball. And like John said in his question as well, he kind of alluded to there's not there's not a Baylor this year. And that is true. There is not, there, there are a lot of other good teams. Don't get me wrong. It's not like Gonzaga is the only good team in the country. That's putting way too much pressure on them, but there, every other team has kind of faltered at, at times, including Gonzaga who has faltered at times as well. They are not far from perfect. They're playing as close to perfect as they can right now, but they are not a perfect team. Auburn, very, very good. A tremendous challenge for Gonzaga. Duke obviously has had their Miss falls lately, but still beat Gonzaga and could do it again. There's no debate about that. Baylor, similar situation, has had their fails, but is still a really good basketball team. Kentucky, Purdue, there's still a lot of good teams out there that I think could give Gonzaga some trouble. But if they play the way they have played lately, they're going to be really, really hard to beat. Next question comes from Havila Benjamin on Twitter. He says, what is your prediction for the Zags record in the month of February ahead of their tougher road stretch they have coming up? And which game are they most likely to drop? Yeah, I don't think Gonzaga is going to lose in the month of February. I don't like being the person who never predicts them to lose because I think that they are certainly capable of losing games. It is not impossible to think that they will lose a game. But they do have two games against St. Mary's this month. St. Mary's the best, second best team in the WCC right now per Ken Palm, per net, per a lot of other ways to grade out talent on this roster. St. Mary's is the number two team. I believe they're the second best team in the conference just from the eye test as well as all of the metrics. And they got them twice, obviously once in Moraga, once in the kennel. The game in Moraga is far, far and away Gonzaga's most difficult game remaining on the schedule with BYU struggling the way that they have lately with San Francisco being a very good team and playing San Francisco in War Memorial is not going to be easy. But right now I think St. Mary's in Moraga with Randy Bennett's style, with the fact that they have been effective at shutting down Gonzaga by playing this really methodical pace and playing good defense. They've done it before, so they can do it again. I think they will have more success at that than any team has so far this season. But I, I, they, I just don't think they have the offensive firepower. They've scored more points lately, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But I still don't think Gonzaga is going to lose that game. I think they're going to come out of February with the same number of losses, too, that they had going into the month. Next up, this question comes from Jacob Quarter 2 on Twitter. He says, as we enter the home stretch, do you think Gonzaga will be the number one seed in the West if either UCLA or Arizona go undefeated from here on out? Well, like I said, I don't think Gonzaga is going to lose. So if Gonzaga doesn't lose... And if one of you, both UCLA and Arizona can't go undefeated, obviously they're playing each other one more time on February 3rd. So very, very soon. If whichever team wins that game also does not lose a single other game, I don't think either of these teams will overtake Gonzaga. Unless, of course, Gonzaga loses. Gonzaga would probably have to lose to somebody other than St. Mary's, I think, even to not be the number one seed in the West. Uh, But again, obviously UCLA and Arizona will play a better schedule from here on out than Gonzaga will. But Let's say it's UCLA. Let's say UCLA beats Arizona again and does not lose for the rest of the season. Their resume is still not going to stack up all that well to Gonzaga. And even if it stacks up close, there's a tiebreaker. And I know that using transitive property on those games isn't always all that accurate, but Gonzaga blew the doors off of UCLA back in November. They weren't fully healthy. That's a that's a fine argument to use, but Gonzaga didn't win by two. <laughs> it won by a lot. So I don't think UCLA would overtake Gonzaga for the number one seed in the West. If Arizona beats UCLA and also does not lose for the rest of the season, beats USC, beats the rest of the Pac-12, I think there will be an argument, some level of argument, but I still don't think their resume will be strong. They haven't played a great schedule, and their conference sk- schedule obviously is fine. The Pac-12 is good. It is better than the WCC, uh, at least top to bottom. It certainly is, but they already have one loss against really the only team that should strongly challenge them in UCLA. So even if they beat them on the other end, 
I still don't think their resume is strong enough to take over for the number one seed in the West. It is Gonzaga's number one seed to lose. If they do not lose from here on out, I think they take it. Next question comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, can you talk a little about Chet Holmgren's off the stat sheet impact? We're seeing it more and more. Yeah, I think we've been seeing it all along. To be honest, I think, you know, one of the stats that always stood out to me about Chet Holmgren's performance this season was in that Texas game where you drew Timmy at 37 points, Chet Holmgren, his first big in the spotlight game of his career. He had two points and five rebounds. There was a lot of consternation. Is he going to be the player we want him to be? You know, is he going to fade under pressure or whatever? You know, that those kinds of concerns, which I can understand why they cropped up when he had a really kind of disappearing act in such a big game. But in that game, Chet Holmgren, when he was on the floor, Texas took 15, 1-5% of their shots at the rim. When he was not on the floor, they took 54% of their shots at the rim. They were afraid to go around the basket with Chet Holmgren in the game. That is the kind of off-the-stat sheet impact that is monumentally significant. That has been true in every game Gonzaga has played this year. He has a huge impact by altering shots, by forcing players to pull up for mid-ranges when normally they would attack the basket by passing up good shots or good looks around the rim because of his presence. Beyond that, he's a load on offense. He's really difficult to defend. Uh, he's knocking down his shots at an obscene rate right now. But even when he's not, defenders have to respect him from three. Again, that space is the floor. That's why the high-low is so effective, is if Chet Holmgren has the ball at the top of the key and his defender is sagging off of him, Chet's just going to hit the three. I don't. I swear he's never missed a three from the top of the key in his career. So the defender has to be really up out close on him. That means Drew Timmy has all of the space in the world to establish his position, catch the basketball, make a post move, score a bucket, which he does really, really well. Same with Anton Watson. When either of those two guys are in the game alongside Chet Holmgren, they, it's easier for him to navigate that high-low offense because of that ability. Beyond all of that, if we're talking full-on off-the-basketball stuff, we're talking about a really poised young man, a, a great kid, a good teammate. He's joking around with teammates on the sideline. You can see that. He does some of Drew Timmy's goofy celebrations along with him. He's really professional with the media. And again, I think the number one thing, he didn't come to Gonzaga thinking it's more important that I get the basketball, that I put up big numbers, that I'm the number one pick. It's very clear he does not have that mentality. I cannot stress how rare it is to get a number one recruit with that mentality. And this is not bashing other players who are the number one recruits in their class who have come in and demanded the basketball and wanted to be the 25 point per game score. You know, I'm not trying to knock a Ben Simmons or a Trey Young or any or Anthony Davis or any of those types of players because, you know, they're really, really good. <laughs> and, and Chet, it took him a while to start out the season to start to find his offensive rhythm because he was so willing to let Drew Timmy score most of the points, or even Anton Watson or some of the guards. And I think that that's a skill that is going to help this team win basketball games, even if it may be slightly, slightly detracting from his draft stock. I think by the end of the, by the time the draft rolls around, he's going to be a top three pick, probably a top two pick. He's going to be right in that conversation with Jabari Smith and Paolo Bancaro. And I don't think that, and I think that his mentality and his willingness to let his team win, whatever it takes is going to actually help him when the draft rolls around. All right, last question from segment one. This comes from Josh Edits on Twitter. He says, who's number 22? I don't recognize the guy in that jersey, especially over the last 10 games or so, but I hope he sticks around. Yeah, folks, Anton Watson's been good for about 20 games now. I think he's averaging about 12, 13 points per game since then. He had one really rough stretch in the middle of the non-conference season where he fouled out uh, and committed a ton of fouls in like a four-game stretch. I think he averaged like less than four points per game, and it was he was really struggling. He was committing a lot of fouls. He was not looking for his shot offensively. His defense was good, but again, it, it, your defense can only be so good when you're playing constantly in foul trouble. There were some comments that maybe we should play Ben Gregg may, more. Maybe we should play Julian Strother more in a small ball four role. And Anton has completely turned it around since then. He's been one of the best players in the country. In fact, and those of you who are on Twitter, you may have seen this from Evan Miyawa, who does phenomenal individual player analysis and assessment. He's one of the best in the business. He has a player rater and Anton Watson, number four player in the country based on his offensive and defensive contributions to Gonzaga's team. The fourth best player in the country by these advanced analytics. Now he's not going to finish fourth in the player of the year rankings, nor do I believe that he should finish fourth in the player of the year rankings this year. But 
the argument that he's one of the 20 best players in the country, to me, I, I continue to strongly pound the drum that Anton Watson is one of the 20 best players in college basketball this season. And the fact that he's coming off the bench, the fact that he's clearly the third big on this team doesn't make me feel any less strongly about that. His ability to impact the team on both ends of the floor. Yeah, his outside shooting is still inconsistent. He did knock down a three against Portland, but that's still not really a part of his game that has developed. Even his mid-range game is suspect. But his offensive ability under the rim, his ability to move without the basketball, his passing ability, and his defense all combined make him one of the most impactful players in the game of college basketball. And next year, he's going to be an unbelievable force on this roster. All right, we got more listener submitted questions coming up in the second segment, talking all things WCC. But before we get there, I want to tell you all about Get Upside. Hey, Zags fans, this is Andy Patton with an incredible app everyone who buys gas needs to know about called Get Upside. My listeners are earning cash back for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code SCORE for 25 cents per, per gallon or more on your first fill up. That's cash back. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using GetUpside. Just download the app for free and use promo code SCORE for 25 cents per gallon or more on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to $300 a year in cash back, and there's no catch. The cash back gets added right to your account. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code SCORE to get 25 cents per gallon or more cash back on your first tank. Hey folks, Andy Patton here to introduce our new sponsor, Homefield. Homefield is a premium collegiate apparel brand based out of Indianapolis, offering incredibly comfortable, officially licensed apparel with vintage college designs. Homefield is kicking off big new Saturday season three, where they launch a new school on their site every Saturday for eight straight weeks. Gonzaga is week two. Homefield digs through the arcades and history of the school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful decisions for your school. They launched their Gonzaga collection on January 29th. I'm sure most, if not all of you, were on Twitter. You saw all of the excitement about this launch. And folks, this stuff is incredible. 14 vintage pieces of apparel. They have designs that are t-shirts. They have hoodies. They have crew necks. They have sleeveless t-shirts. Incredible stuff, all vintage. The designs are incredible. I'm rocking one of them right now. For those of you checking it out on YouTube, they have some really, really fun stuff. Captain Zag, Teddy Gonzaga, one of the original mascots for the school back in the 20s. And guys, not only is this stuff really, really cool looking, it's insanely comfortable, the most comfortable stuff I've ever worn. And I have sensitive skin, so it's really important to me that the clothes are comfortable. They are long fitting, so they're they're slim fit. It's, it's some of the best clothing that I've ever bought. I genuinely mean that. You absolutely need to go to Homefield. Check this stuff out if you have not already. New customers can get 15% off their first purchase from Homefield if they use the code LOCKEDONZAGS at checkout at homefieldapparel.com. All right, Andy Patton, still locked on Zags, still talking mailbag Monday. Segment two, we're talking mostly WCC. Folks had a lot of questions about the viability of the four-bid WCC in the NCAA tournament after a couple of the results from last week. We'll start out with this question from Havila Benjamin, the second of the show. He says, after BYU's losses to Santa Clara and Pacific and USF's choke against St. Mary's, which team is on thinner ice to make the tournament right now? And what does each of them have to do to make it in? Yeah, BYU has the worst loss, but USF, unfortunately, is on thinner ice. I think the committee will look at Ken Palm ratings, where BYU is still higher. They will look at the net ratings and the quad victories and all of that stuff. And also, they're going to take into account like school's reputation. They're going to take into account some of that stuff that I don't know that they necessarily should take into account. BYU has made four tournaments in the last 10 years. USF has not made the NCAA tournament in decades. I think that that is going to have an impact, whether it should or not, is certainly another debate as well. For me, what do they each need to do? Uh, BYU needs to win every game except Gonzaga. I think that they can get by without beating the Zags if they win every other game. That includes USF. That includes St. Mary's. They need to win those games. They also, you know, cannot lose to Santa Clara. They sure as hell cannot lose to Pacific or Portland or San Diego or LMU or any of those teams as well. They probably also need to make the WCC championship game. I think if they win out, except for Gonzaga, 
And then they lose in the second round or the first round of the WCC tournament. They lose to either San Francisco or St. Mary's and finish third or fourth in the WCC. They're going to be right on that line. I think they're safer than USF, but it's still going to be tough. For USF, I think USF probably needs to win out. That obviously includes BYU. They need to win that game. They need to beat St. Mary's uh, and they need to beat Gonzaga. And that's going to be really tough. Gonzaga beat them pretty badly the first time they played. Of course, USF hung with them longer than most teams have hung with them. They actually were only down three at halftime. Kudos to them for that. This next game will be at War Memorial, which is more of an advantage for them because they will be at their home court. They, War Memorial has given Gonzaga fits in the past, although not super recently. But if, if USF loses to Gonzaga, even if they win the rest of their games and they make the WCC title game and they lose there again, They'll be really close. That'll be really, really close. If they manage to pull that off, win every game except for two against Gonzaga, play in the WCC title game, maybe keep it kind of close in the WCC title game. I could see them getting one of those first four, you know, getting a chance to play in the 68 team field. And I would feel really bad for whatever, you know, average 500, 500 esque uh, power five school they get to play in that game because I think USF would blow the doors off of them. But I think that they're on really thin ice right now. Next question comes from Mike Miller at MillerMike123 on Twitter. He says, what does BYU, USF, and St. Mary's need to do between now and Selection Sunday for a four-bid WCC? Well, we already addressed BYU and St. Mary's, or excuse me, and USF. So I'm going to use this space to address St. Mary's, the other team. Randy Bennett's squad's in pretty good shape, to be honest right now. They're in the best shape of any team in the WCC not named Gonzaga, of course. They're number 20th in Ken Palm. Uh, they have a really, really sparkly record. They have a win over USF, which is huge. They really needed that. They did lose to BYU. They also have a, a win over Santa Clara, which is a quad two win, so it's not nothing. But again, it, it's <laughs> BYU did not pick up that same victory, so it's nice that St. Mary's was able to do so. Uh, obviously, part of the reason St. Mary's is in a better spot is because they have not played Gonzaga yet. They are the only team out of those three who has yet to play Gonzaga. They got two games against them this month, or the month of February, excuse me. If they lose both games to Gonzaga, if they lose both of those games, and they but they beat USF, and they split with BYU, which means they beat them the second time, I think they're fine. I think they're fine if they do that. I think there's a reasonable chance that St. Mary's would still get in if they lose both to Gonzaga and if they sweep USF and they lose both to BYU. So if BYU beats them again and Gonzaga beats them twice, maybe even three times in the WCC tournament, I still think St. Mary's is probably going to get in, but it definitely complicates things quite a bit. But also St. Mary's still got Santa Clara again, and this is the kind of team that could really lose to just about anybody. Randy Bennett's team is so so re reliant on offense, on efficient offense. They, they take very few possessions. They take all 30 seconds on the shot clock. They play very good defense, which means that they have less possessions to get the basketball. They win based on scoring not a lot of points, but scoring at an efficient rate. And if they're not doing that on a, on a certain day, they're susceptible to losing to everybody in this conference. Everybody in this conference is capable of beating them. Now, you, they have a lot of size in Matthias Toss and Dan Fotu. That helps a lot against the teams that just don't have a lot of size. They're more likely to body them up that way. But this is a team that is susceptible to dropping one of those games. And if they do that, suddenly their space as a potential tournament team gets a lot thinner. Next up from Jacob Quarter 2 on Twitter, his second of the show, he says, if, and that's a big if, the WCC is a four-bid conference, what team between St. Mary's, BYU, and San Francisco makes it the furthest in the tournament? Yeah, I think I'm still probably going to take St. Mary's here. Uh, again, obviously, seeding is a huge factor. If, if one of them draws a really, really good team uh, in the first round or a really, really hot team in the first round or just... If BYU doesn't draw any big teams, they're maybe more likely to advance. Whereas if they draw a team that has a lot of size, they're probably less likely to advance because that's kind of their weakness. So it's hard to know without seeing the seeding, obviously. But I think I'd probably take St. Mary's. I think St. Mary's is, is, is they're tricky because they're the team that I think is also most likely to lose their first game because, as I mentioned before, their offense is so reliant on being super efficient and they just, they don't have the guys that they had in the past, like Jock Landale, like Emmett Narr, uh, like Rob Johnson, like Omar Samhan, some of those guys who really helped them be able to do that because this team doesn't have as many high level efficient playmakers makes them more susceptible to those losses. But I still think that they have, this isn't the kind of team that I think could easily be in the sweet 16. And it would, it wouldn't surprise me at all based on the way that they've been playing lately. Next question comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, BYU's loss to Pacific bodes badly for everyone in the WCC other than Gonzaga. 
as it relates to strength of schedule, right? I said, it's not bad for Pacific. <laughs> it is sure as heck not bad for the Tigers of Pacific. But yeah, every year, this is the unfortunate battle that Gonzaga fans kind of have to reckon with of, of liking to see upsets because we are by nature fans of a sport where upsets are fun. And as Gonzaga was the underdog for so long, we naturally want to see a lot of those with the, we have to reckon that with the ability that, or the knowledge that any time a good team in the WCC loses to a bad team, it reinforces these negative stereotypes about our conference and significantly hampers those teams' ability to go to the NCAA tournament. BYU was a top 25 team per Ken Palm that had one bad night, lost to one bad team, and is now a tournament bubble team. That does not happen to Power 5 schools. Power 5 schools who are right on the border of being a top 25 team, like USC, for example, they lost to Stanford, who was one of the bad teams in the Pacific 12, or the Pac-12. USC dropped a handful of spots in Ken Palm. Granted, BYU, when they lost to Pacific, they only dropped a handful of spots in Ken Palm as well. However, the narrative that you hear about USC when they lost to Stanford is, oh, it's hilarious. USC has lost to Stanford twice. The narrative around USC is not, are they going to be a tournament team? Most people still expect USC to be a tournament team. There's really not any dis any conversation indicating that that's not the case. Whereas with BYU, as you have heard in these questions and as we have heard on national media and on Twitter, there's a legitimate conversation about whether BYU will make the tournament because of this one bad loss. Like, obviously, losing to Stanford is not as bad as losing to Pacific. I'm not saying those two things are exactly even. They are not. But it's still frustrating that we that our teams cannot, they have to be basically perfect in conference play in order to make the NCAA tournament. Next question comes from Larry via Gmail. He says, what the heck happened to BYU? Were they caught looking ahead to San Francisco and Zags coming to Provo? Yeah, potentially, I think part of it, I, I think assuming that players were not thinking about the game they were playing every time they lose is a little bit disingenuous. Players are pretty, they're, they're aware that they're playing a basketball game against good basketball players and they need to play well to win. Uh, but I do think with BYU in this case, uh, they're really just, they're really reliant on Alex Barcelo. They don't have depth in the front court. The rest of their guard play is inconsistent at best. They're missing Gavin pa Baxter, which hurts them. And so Barcelo needs to shoulder the load offensively in a major way. He had 19 points against Pacific, but he shot five for 14 from the field. So he missed a lot of shots. He didn't get into an offensive groove. Caleb Lohner, who had a good game against Gonzaga, but has had a rough season in general. He finished three for 10. This team just doesn't have a secondary scorer. They don't have a player to shoulder the load if Barcelo's not having a good day. It's been their weakness all year long. It's been exploited against Santa Clara. It was exploited by Gonzaga and now is exploited by Pacific. They need to find somebody to step up and be a big time secondary scorer for them, or they're going to continue to lose or at least play really un unnecessarily close games throughout the rest of conference play. And that's going to put them in a not favorable spot come March. And then Larry finished or followed that up with another question saying, in non-St. Mary's style, their last three games, they scored 83, 72, and 81 points. Are they the team the Zags will have the toughest time with in the rest of WCC play? Unquestionably, yes, absolutely. St. Mary's has gotten a little bit of flack. Early in the year, people were, were willing to put them third, fourth, fifth, even in some places in the WCC. This is the second best team in the conference. They are the second best team in the WCC. They are better than BYU. They are better than San Francisco. I know BYU beat them, but I think when they play each other again, that St. Mary's will take that game. They have size in Matias Toss, who had an incredible game against San Francisco. He had 27 points and 12 rebounds on that one. They have good guard play. Tommy Cousy has stepped up in a big way. Logan Johnson has been playing better as of late. Uh, they're great defensively, as they always are under Coach Bennett. This is a good team. This is a good team that I think will challenge Gonzaga. They will give them a close game in Moraga. I think the Zags will win, especially the way they've been shooting the basketball lately. But this is a good, one of the 25 best teams in college basketball. All right, two segments down. Coming up in the third segment, we're going to answer even more listener-submitted questions. It's a jam-packed mailbag this week. But before we get there, I want to tell you all about Built Bar. It's the New Year, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good you'll want to eat it. Unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky or waxy or taste like a chemical spill, you want to eat healthy, but it just gets so boring. By now, you might be thinking, this is just not worth it. Where's the chocolate? But Bilt Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, here's an idea for the new year. 
Go to all your secret treat stashes, at home, in the pantry, at the office, in the car, wherever. Throw out all of the sugary or calorie-filled treats and replace them with Bilt Bars. So when you're craving a snack or a treat, you can reach for something that's healthy and tastes incredible. Go to Bilt.com right now and use promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your first order. That's LOCKED15 for 15% off at Bilt.com. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still answering listener submitted questions all episode long. This next one comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, the physicality in the Portland game was clearly not only a playing hard mentality. After the game, Drew Timmy spoke pretty honestly about it, essentially saying the Zags didn't appreciate it. I thought they handled it well during the game, but the fact that Anton Watson got a T indicates there was a problem. Yeah, I mean, this is just a thing that happens every year in the WCC. I'm not concerned about it. I'm not going to... Uh, cry out about Portland or Shantae or any of any of that. Uh, there, they got beat. They were getting beat. They were frustrated. They committed some dumb fouls. There was some pushing around. It, it happens. Playing basketball at this level is highly competitive. There's trash talk all the time. Our players are talking a ton of crap. I want everybody to acknowledge that that is happening. They're saying mean stuff, and sometimes they get pushed around for it. I'm not saying they deserve it. I'm not saying that it's not a it, it's still a bad thing to do and you should get punished for it with technical fouls and everything like that. But these WCC teams are feisty. This is their biggest game of the season. They come in juiced and amped up to play and, and sometimes emotions get the best of you. It's just one of those things that happens. Next up, this question comes from Dad Risk on Twitter. He says, I hate to ask this, but are we sure Ben Gregg is a part of the core group of players going forward? That's been the talk, but he's not on the level that Strother and Harris were as freshmen. It's so easy to get left behind at GU now with all their talent. Well, I don't think it's fair to compare Ben Gregg as a freshman to Julian Strother and Dominic Harris because they play very different positions. And Gonzaga's growth plan for bigs has always been different than their growth plan for, for guards and forwards. It's always been different. I am. It is way too early to rule out Ben Gregg as a core piece of this team. I think there is a little bit of concern about how what the front court is going to look like next year, assuming Timmy and Holmgren both leave, because that would rely on Ben Gregg playing a bigger role. And I'm not certain he's completely ready for the kind of role that could be available to him next year. But again, he's a freshman. He is not a sophomore. He was a high school senior last year who is a freshman this year. That is a very important way to think about him. Gonzaga freshman bigs don't normally look like Chet Holmgren. This is very unique. They don't normally look like Drew Timmy either, who was very good in a reserve role, reserve role as a freshman. They look a lot like Shem or Kelly Olinick or Roni Turiaf or Philip Petrusev. Those guys were not good when they were freshmen or Sam Dower. Those guys were bad when they were freshmen or at least not good. I don't want to say bad. That's a bit mean, but they weren't, they weren't nearly the players that they became. Big man development at Gonzaga is a process. It takes some time. Lately, they have been able to churn some of these guys around in two years. That's what was incredible about the growth of Philip Petrusev, who blew up his second year. Same with Drew Timmy, blew up his second year. Same with DeMontis Sabonis. Some guys do turn this thing around in two years, but by and large, for the most part, it has been a multi-year growth development plan. And this is not Ben Gregg's second year. It's barely <laughs> because he played only a half of last year, and he was a high school senior who was both basically just sitting on the bench, getting used to being at college games in that environment. This is his freshman year. He will take leaps and bounds next year and be better. He may not be Killian Tilly 2.0, which is what we've been hoping for, but I think he's absolutely part of the core. I don't know whether he will have a starting role handed to him next year, but he's going to be a big part of it, and I think it's too early to say to be overly concerned about his performance on the court in what has been just a, a handful of minutes in his true freshman year. Next question comes from John via Gmail. He says, if Hickman, Salas, and Strother all come back next year, do you think they will start? If so, where does that leave Dom Harris? If Harris isn't a starter, is he at risk of transferring to another program? Would Tommy Lloyd potentially be a landing spot? So that we just we jumped through a whole bunch of different topics there in these questions. We'll kind of address them one by one. Yeah, Hickman, Salas, Strother all come back. Yes, they're all starting. Strother very obviously is starting because he's starting this year. Hickman and Salas have clearly proven that they deserve to be the starting backcourt on this team next year. 
if they all come back, which I think is a big if, not necessarily a guaranteed conclusion, then yes, I think Dominic Harris would come off the bench. He'd be a high-level bench player, but I think that would be the role. He'd be playing, you know, 18, 25 minutes per night, kind of an Aaron Cook type role, what Andrew Nembhard was last year before he actually settled into a full-on starters role, similar to what Nolan Hickman's role is this year. Uh, the transferring thing, I don't know. I mean, it's impossible to know. Uh, obviously, if a player thought they'd be a starter by now and they're not a starter, you could that's that's a circumstance where we see players transfer in the past. So I understand we're kind of applying that this is what other players do, so maybe this is what Dom will do. Dom has proven he is not like other players. He is fiercely loyal to this program. He committed here as a sophomore in high school as he rocketed up boards and did not waver on that commitment, did not decommit and look to go somewhere else. Instead, worked very hard to get Julian Strother and Jalen Suggs to come to this program. Instead, that kind of attitude, that kind of mentality doesn't strike me as somebody who would give up on a program when he hasn't really even had a chance to prove himself. Injuries caused him this year if he was just rotting on the bench because Mark Few wasn't playing him, then I think this would be a more legitimate conversation. As it stands, he's just not healthy. I don't think that that's going to com- cause him to leave. I have no idea what his relationship with Tommy Lloyd is like. I assume that Lloyd is not the person who recruited him. It was likely Brian Michelson who recruited Dom. Don't know how much that matters. I, I just don't know. I don't have a firm answer for you here. I don't get the impression that Dom is planning to transfer after this year. I don't think that he will start next year if... Certainly if Nolan Hickman, Hunter Salas, and Julian Strother are all back. But if any of those guys are gone, that's a much likelier opportunity for Dom to start. Or, and I'm just going to read John's second follow-up question here. He says, if Timmy does not come back, could they potentially go with the starting lineup of Hickman, Salas, Harris, Strother, and Watson at the five? Does that give Gonzaga enough rebounding and rim protection? Yeah, this could be an answer. I don't know if this would be their starting lineup, uh, but I think this is a lineup you could potentially see more. I've kind of for a while, I was banging the drum for more of Strother to play that small ball four role. It ended up being very not something they needed because of the tremendous emergence of Anton Watson this season. Uh, and I think Gonzaga is a little weary of doing that because last year they played Corey Kispert at the four almost all season long, and it impacted them significantly in that Baylor game where they didn't have enough depth in the front court. I don't think they want to do that again this year. I think it ultimately is going to come down to what they find on the transfer market. If we assume Drew Timmy is gone, Gonzaga is going to peruse, regardless, they're going to peruse the transfer market pretty extensively. If they can get in an impactful rim protecting big man, then I think you see Watson start at the four and you see a a traditional three guards uh, with Harris coming off the bench. If they find a really good guard, but they don't find a lot of depth in the front court that they really like, then yeah, I think there's a possibility that Strother spends a lot of his time playing at the four and then they play more three guard lineups and kind of initiate Dom into the lineup more that way. It just depends on what they see on the transfer market. It's too early to know right now. I'm not concerned about Dominic Harris's future just yet. Uh, If he decides he wants to transfer, then hats off to him. Hope he has a great career, but I have not gotten any indication whatsoever that that's something he's thinking about. And in fact, what I know about him as a person would lead me to believe that that's not something he's thinking about doing. And the final question of the show comes from Christian via Gmail. What goals can the Zag set for the rest of the WCC schedule? To not lose, that would be the number one thing that they are aiming for. This team is solely focused on winning every basketball game in front of them. That is the goal. Mark Few has this team always running one step at a time. I think there are some other things, obviously, that they can work on. Continuing to shoot well from three is huge. Establish that they can be a consistently very, very good three-point shooting team would be a wonderful thing for them to do throughout the month of February. I continue to utilize Chet and Anton on offense, even at the expense of Drew Timmy. I think establishing that you have three post players who can score down under the basket consistently is huge. It, it makes them less dependent on Drew when, when March rolls around. They were really dependent on Drew Timmy last year in the March and he in March, and he carried them all the way to the national championship game before he kind of wore out a little bit at the end. They do not want to be that reliant on him again this year. Uh, So having Chet and Anton score more down low is going to continue to help with that. Uh, Allow Hunter Salas to blossom. He has blossomed tremendously the last week or so. He's a more confident outside shooter. Uh, He's more confident with the basketball in his hands as a playmaker, as a distributor. He's still an elite defensive player. I think continuing to let him play more minutes, be more free on offense, kind of do more of that stuff is a huge development for this team. It will help them in March and next season if he chooses to return. And then I think try to do the same with Ben Gregg. We talked about him a little bit earlier. Let him get more minutes. Let the offense kind of run through him down low, see what he can do 
in that kind of situation, maybe play him more with Anton Watson, kind of see what that situation looks like, because that could be a big part of their future next season. All right, that is going to do it for me today. Plenty to discuss for the rest of this week, all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. Search youtube.com, Locked On Zags. Hit that subscribe button if you have not already. Finally, thank you again for making the show your first listen of the day. Now is a great time to make your second listen of the day, the Locked On Bets podcast. Locked On Bets is your daily one-stop shop for all of your sports gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags!